Well, thank you very much, Bob, and thank you for the work that you do. And representative from Focus on the Family, we greatly appreciate um, what Bob and his staff do, and Bob's a, Bob's a good, good friend. Well, we heard this morning from Walt a very personal experience story about the transgender issue. And, I mean, life experience, his 72 years worth of, of experience is, you can't argue with that. It's a very powerful thing. But what I want to talk about is bring the more boring part of it, if you will, and that's the research part that really supports that what Walt is saying, and not just that Walt is a one-off, that the research, and I'm a Christian, and as a Christian working in a Christian ministry, I do secular research. I don't do my own research, but I do secondary research, which is reading widely across the literature and seeing what the literature says and trying to be honest about it. And not conservative literature or religious literature, but the leading literature in the body of literature on these issues. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon. And when you are the speaker after lunch, that is a very difficult situation to be in. <laughs> because sometimes I have difficulty understanding what God's will for my life is, except around nap time. It is absolutely God's will for me to take a nap right at this moment. And sometimes that happens after lunch. So I would ask you to disobey God's will for you <laughs> right now, no matter how strongly you might feel it. And I'll try to make it as interesting as I possibly can for you. My talk, Mrs. Jenner, Bruce Jenner, can... Bruce actually become Caitlin, and as we're going to see in a minute, there's many who believe he didn't become Caitlin, he always has been Caitlin. He was just putting on and living a lie, if you will, as Bruce. But it's remarkable how significant and how quickly the transgender issue has come upon us. These are just cover stories of major magazines in the last couple of years on the trans issue. I mean, all these individuals on the covers, them talking about how significant this issue is, and you wonder, where did this come from so quickly? That is the question. I don't have an answer to that. But what is the issue itself? And we need to understand that as Ryan talked about in his section, Bob asked him the question at the very end of their interview, and he said, do you think that we're going to see a rescinding of all this maybe, or that um, something's going to happen to this freight train push of this transgender and the LGB issues and things like that? And he said, I think there are, and it comes down to that when you are telling a lie about human nature and about human anthropology, that any detective knows this. If you're going to lie to him, you got to get your story down because you are going to be found out because your story is going to contradict itself one place or the other. And we're starting to see this here, and it's a far bigger issue, and it is a more if you will, and I, and I use this term lightly, insane issue, then we typically appreciate it. I want to show you just one picture. This came, the one story in the Atlantic, another story was in Time Magazine. Um, the big picture there is, oh my goodness, a man who has the equipment to nurse his baby. No, this is a woman who grew a beard, and likes to present and thinks that she is a man. But the breasts give it away. Okay? But magazines, Time Magazine presented this as if this is something to celebrate. And I guarantee you that only about 1% of people who read Time Magazine 
didn't say, oh my goodness. Okay? This other gentleman up here, this is a story in the Atlantic. This is a, a woman who tranced to a man. She had her breasts removed, but she still had her uterus. She gave birth to that child. And get this. She thinks she's a man. She had an overwhelming, obsessive drive to nurse her new baby. But her breasts were gone. But what happened was they didn't remove all the milk ducts. And so when she later stages of pregnancy and after birth, her milk ducts started coming in. And she writes about, she writes about this, this, this guy, writes about how thankful she was. Not just sort of heartwarming thankful, obsessively, psychologically thankful that she had milk, that she could just for a little bit of time nurse her child. That was that woman's heart in her. You can change the body, but you can't change the inside. That's what Walt was saying as well. And this is what we're seeing on this issue. Let me show you another remarkable one. And before I show it to you, let me give you just um, a quick foundation, if I can, in gender theory. Pretend I'm a gender theory professor and that you're the students in a gender theory class. And I will say the problem with these two guys is um, this woman was assigned female at birth. And this guy was assigned female at birth um, because they looked at body parts. The doctors, when they came out of the womb, they just looked at body parts and said, well, this must be a female. Gender theory teaches us that, no, it's not just the body that determines whether we're male or female or not, but what's up here in our mind. And it is unfair and assumptive to assign either male or female to a little baby. It's unenlightened just because of the body of that baby. Okay, that is orthodoxy gender theory 101. Here's a story recently, just last year in CNN. Transgender man gives birth to a boy. Tristan, the pregnant individual here, which the extended belly with a baby in it kind of gives that away, okay? Man or woman, right? Regardless of the beard, things like that. Tristan Reese was assigned. He was cheated by the doctors and his parents because they assigned him a female gender at birth simply because he had a vagina. He hooks up with this guy, Biff Chaplow. I love that name, his partner Biff Chaplow. Um, he sounds like a character in a sitcom. They gave birth to a baby. What was the baby? It was a boy. They named the boy Leo, okay? Now, you as good students in gender theory class are going to have a question. Does anybody know what that question is? How did they know? They, folks, they violated Leo by telling him he was going to be a boy. But here's the story. They cannot keep their story straight. And CNN plays along with it. These are journalists. Journalists are suspicious. They ask the tough questions. Like, you know what? No, they're just going along with it. And I encourage you, as you see these things, try to look for the kind of inconsistencies in the story. You'll be amazed at where they show up here and there. And it's sad. It's sad because these are the lives of people and what are they being established upon? And we need to look at this. So we need to think about what is the deal with being transgender? And not just for the individual. What I wrote a book a couple of years ago, Loving My LGBT Neighbor, Being Friends in Grace and Truth. 
And I make the distinction between the individual that we always have to love and care for and accept and embrace with grace. But there's the issue itself that we have to deal with in truth. Because it is not compassionate to anybody to play along with something that simply is not true. Now, we always deal with the person with grace. As I like to say, the two eyes that you're connecting with, your humanity to that humanity, always gracious. But in terms of the issue itself, the truth, let us understand the truth. Let us not compromise on the truth. Let us discuss what the truth is with the other person. Even that discussion is very important, but we can't have that today, unfortunately, because even to raise questions about the gender issue is not seen as tolerable, and that's very unfortunate. Okay, the underlying beliefs of of gender theory here that I want to go through real quick, there's just a couple of them. One is that male and female are social constructs. I am a male, but I am only a male, and I dress like this, and I act like a male because society tells me what a male should act like. You're a female because not anything really within you, but society tells you this is what a female does. This is how a female acts, and you must act this way. It's a social construct. Society puts that upon us, okay? But think about this, and we're going to see this in just a minute. Unless you're transgender, then you are becoming the woman, the man that you actually are. And we're going to see a quote to that effect in a minute. Somebody said that about Bruce Jenner. He is now, Caitlin has become the woman that she is and always has been. One's a social construct when it's natural, if you will, my maleness or your femininity. But if you're trans, no, then that is what you actually are. You can't have it both ways. Okay? The next thing, sex and gender are different things. They will say, just in a a cute little way of saying it, gender is what is between your ears and sex is what's between your legs. But we need to know this. We'll hear this, and I get presented with it so often on college campuses. Well, Mr. Stanton, we're so glad you came here, but you don't seem to understand. You're conflating. That's the word that they always use. You're conflating sex and gender as if they're the same thing. Yes, absolutely I am. That is because there is no scientific clinical discovery that science has made, not just in the last couple of years or 10 years or 20 years, but ever, that says, okay, we used to think that sex and gender were just grammatical. We use gender when we don't want to confuse it with the physical act. But now we had this scientific discovery, and now we know that gender is what's between your ears, sex is what's between your legs. There's no science. There's not even an effort to have discovered that. It is just a philosophy, a theory, an ideology that some radical theorists came up with and just said, let's just start calling these two things different. Now, there is a difference, if you will, between, you know, let me be frank, we're all adults here. I have a penis, okay, and I have testes and I have those physical things. But there are things and there can be things about me that are not stereotypically or particularly male. I can like to ballet dance. That doesn't mean I'm less of a male. I could like to sew. It doesn't mean that I'm any less of a male. It just means I'm a different kind of male. Okay? You can have a woman here, vagina, uterus, breasts. She can drive an Indy car like Patrick Danica and win and be bad at it. There's another word I was going to put in there, okay? 
You can have a woman that can shoot a gun, shoot a moose, field dress that moose, carry it all back to the campsite, and feed everybody with it. I mean, she, she is... She is Stereo, she's not stereotypically what a female would be, but she's just a different type of female. So yes, sex and gender are, you know, that how we live out our sex or our gender difference can be different, but it doesn't mean we're a different kind of gender, if you will. Does that make sense? Next is gender is fluid, it's a spectrum. Uh, Facebook was, was addressing this issue and they said, we want to create more options than just male or female because there's lots of different genders. You've probably heard this story. So we, we know that that's a fool's errand for them because gender is not really a spectrum. What they did was they came up with, get this, about 56 to 58 different gender identities that somebody could identify as. Facebook found out the lie behind all this, and you know how? And those of us who saw this knew what was going to happen. 56, 58, 59 genders, and Facebook still had people contacting them saying, why are you discriminating against me because my gender isn't provided? <laughs> Seriously. So what they did in, in all common sense is like, okay, well, tell us your gender and we'll include that. And another call comes with a different gender and another call comes with a different gender. And they realize, okay, you know what? This is not rooted in anything objective. It is purely in the mind of the individual. So what they reverted to was male, female, fill in the blank. <laughs> I mean, they really did like, you know what? We, we can't win here. And you're not going to be able to win when the person, when their gender exists primarily in their mind, and we have to respect, and I mean this honestly and compassionately, we have to respect the mind and the self-conception of the individual explaining to us who they are. Next and last is simply that binary is a naughty word. Binary is the original sin, if you will, in gender theory is that there's only male and female. That's like us saying there's, the only colors are just black and white. We, you know, all these colors in between, they don't really exist. That's how they see people like us, some of us, who say, no, there's only male or female. But it's interesting. When you look at the trans issue, trans is from here to there, transcontinental, transmit, from me to you. If you tell somebody in the gender you know, studies community that you are a trans and they say you're talking on the phone and they can't see you, they will ask you, well, what kind of trans are you? Are you, are you a MTF or an FTM? That means male to female or female to male. Are those the only two options? Yes, they are. Binary. You know? I mean, there's, just, there's not a switching from you know, Facebook's 36, number 36 gender to number 48 gender. You know, it's, and I don't mean that in kind of a got you kind of way. It's just, I'm a student, I'm trying to pay attention to this, I'm trying to take seriously what you're telling me, but it, it doesn't stay consistent here. Now, let's go to the research and let's look at what the research says. What is it to be transgender. This is very important. As we're looking at the transgender individual, what is it that's going on within them? And it simply is this, when one's subjective identity, how I understand myself to be, is different than one's natal sex. What is inside the mind, my own self-understanding, does not align with what my body is telling me what my body is telling the world. And so the transgender person makes the effort to try to make their mind 
fit with their body. Now, this is very important. It was interesting because people would ask me when, when Bruce Jenner went to Caitlin, people would ask me, well, certainly he's had south of the border surgery, right? Because in order to be a transgender person, to be a woman, he can have a penis. It's like, no, not necessarily. I mean, you could have no surgery. You could just, you know, grow a beard. You could, you know, take hormones to keep yourself from growing a beard. You can do anything that you feel like you need to do in order to feel at peace with your physical properties. That even means, according to gender orthodoxy, I could say that I, in my mind, am a woman and I'm totally comfortable with how I present myself as you see a man. Because it's my story, right? And so when we think about the bathroom issue, let's open up the women's bathroom room so that trans women men transitioning to women can come in and use the bathroom. I, according to the rules, could just walk in as a man, use the bathroom, go wash my hands, and if the policy is that bathrooms are open to trans women, all I have to do is just say, you know what, you're saying I'm not a woman, according to whose definition of what a woman is, right? It is all subjective. Now, it's not subjective so much in the mind of the trans individual. I mean, Walt struggled with that. That's who he thought that he was. The trans individual struggles with this. It is a deep, deep struggle that all of us as other human beings, human to human, have to understand are very real. Is it different than intersex? This is another thing. Is being transgender the same as being intersex? It is not. Intersex at, indeed refers to an objective reality. A uh, baby comes out of the womb, has ambiguous genitalia. Either the penis you know, has divided and looks like a vagina, or you can have the clitoris of a little girl growing out to where it looks like the protrusion of a penis, or something like that. that is, that's not a third kind of person. It is simply if you had a baby born without a full arm, or a baby born, we have a little sweet Indian girl in our neighborhood. She thinks it's awesome, and we think it's awesome too. She has six toes on one foot. She always wears sandals so that she can show that off. Okay, We don't think she's a different kind of person, She's a regular little girl who has an extra toe, right? And so that's the issue that with the intersex, it's not a different kind of person. It's just a person whose body, like many of us, I mean, Bob, his face didn't develop like most people's, and he has to live with that. He has to struggle with that. And he's doing the best that he can. <laughs> So we need to know that, that, it's, that it's transgender is, is an issue of the mind. Intersex is an issue, a physical, observable issue with the body. And most of these children, 99% of them, don't have any problem understanding what they are, male or female. So what causes gender identity disorder, when you hear GID, gender identity disorder, or gender dysphoria, gender dysphoria is now the preferred term because it doesn't have disorder in it, but they're both the same thing, and that is there's a dysphoria, a confusion between who I understand myself to be and what my body is telling the world. What causes this? Now, we hear in a lot of political and policy debates, well, this is a natural thing. This is the way that people just are. And people who are struggling with it feel like it's the way they are because it is powerful. It's powerful within them. 
And we need to understand that in a compassionate sort of way. But what does the research tell us? Does the research tell us that it is something rooted in nature, that it is an objective thing? Bottom line, no one really knows what causes it and what's behind it. Kenneth Zucker, um, he ran one of the largest and, and really is one of the brightest and most experienced individuals. He's a Canadian clinician. Um, he just recently closed his clinic because of immense political pressure that came down upon him because he refuses to go along with the mainstream orthodoxy. But he was doing this kind of work, clinical work, with these children before many people were. He said this in an article in The Atlantic in response to an advocacy poster that he keeps in his office that says, this is the way children are. We need to come along and support them. If we don't, suicide and bad things will happen. He says, in terms of empirical data, that is not true. It's just dogma, and I've never liked dogma. Biology is not destiny. Here's another article he wrote to um, a letter to the editor of a very professional journal. And, and he's referring to the question of how come we're seeing all of these, this increase of children that are dealing with gender dysphoria. And he explains, we don't really know why this is. Maybe it's media influence. Maybe it's the internet. Maybe it's you know, actual clinical stuff. But he said, we can't really know because the ideology, that's an a, a academic word for the cause of it, the source of it, the reason for it. The ideology of gender identity disorder is still largely a matter of speculation. Here's another, and we're going to hear from these two people um, a little bit later, but they're from the University Medical Center at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And they have, like Zucker, a great deal of experience in this. They are not conservatives, they're not traditionalists, but they say as well in their articles, no unequivocal ideological factor determining atypical gender development has been found to date. None. And it is not from the sense of trying. Same article. It is most likely a multifactorial condition in which psychosocial and, you know, the way the environment, not the physical environment, but like Walt, the environment the child lives in interacts with the brain through those experiences that they grew up with and could interact with some biological factors. That's just like alcoholism. Anybody can fall into that. But there are some people who have some biological factors that make them more susceptible to that. But there is no cause that we say, okay, we've isolated this cause. And we know that objectively, yes, this person is a transgender person because of this thing going on in their body. No, the best science just simply doesn't know. So when you were told, oh, no, no, this is an objective thing. We know why these people are like they are. We don't. We just don't. And the best science tells us this. This fellow, Michael Bailey, who wrote this piece, he is a... Um, He's, a, he's quite a character. Um, he's a researcher at Northwestern University in Chicago. Um, he's a gay man, very much an activist, very outspoken. But he's one of these gadflies that just says it like it is, and he doesn't care what anybody thinks. And he has written, in fact, this article, and it's um, what many transgender activists don't want you to know, but why you should know it anyways. One of the things he explains is, that the predominant cultural understanding is that transsexuals are my little boy or my little girl was grown into a boy's body. He says, this understanding has little scientific basis. He says little, and it's actually none. Okay, it just actually is none. However, and is inconsistent with clinical observations. 
He's saying when you have a clinician sitting with the child, and Walt says this, when he talks with children and young adults who are dealing with this, he can always get into the familial or the social factor. I'll tell you why you're this way. Because this thing happened to you, and this thing happened to you, and this thing. And no human can have those things happen without some sort of radical implication. That's what Michael Bailey is saying here. It's inconsistent with what he observes and others observe in their clinics. Therefore, the persistence of the predominant cultural understanding, this, you know, a a, a little boy trapped in a girl's body or, or otherwise, is damaging to science and to many transsexuals. He cares about the transsexual patient. He cares deeply. And he says, to go along lock, stock, and barrel with this story is contrary to science, it's contrary to clinical experience, and it's not helpful to the individual. For us, all of us who care about people and their well-being and their happiness, we want everybody to be happy. We want everybody to live at peace with themselves. We do need to pay attention to these issues and not necessarily fall along with the cultural and politically correct script that so many of us are being beaten into that if you don't go along with this, you are a bigot. If you don't go along with this, and I'm going to address this in a minute, you will be causing the suicide of these young people. That's a very serious charge, and I want to address that in just a minute. It's important to know that if being transgendered is a thing, it's what you are, One big point that makes this contrary is, and these are the people that are doing the work from um, the medical school, the medical center in Amsterdam. And they have this big center there. It's a research and clinical center that works with kids that are gender dysphoric. And they're doing some of the largest work in the world, and their findings are very surprising in what they do. But one of the things that they say is, and this this corresponds with a lot of other research, is they use these two terms, persisting and desisting. That a child, prepubescent child, that is gender dysphoric, that up to 80 to 98% of those children will what they call desist by the time they hit puberty. That means that they will come to terms with who they are physically, and it will start to correspond with how they understand themselves. I've got a male body, and I understand myself to be a male. 80 to 90% clinically proven of those gender dysphoric kids will kind of just naturally straighten themselves out. There's a couple of reasons for this that they give. One is increased gender segregation. You know, when the kids are little, everybody plays on the playground together. Later on, when boys and girls both develop cooties, and I'm not quite sure when that happens clinically, but they start to divide out. And, you know, the little boys or little girls is like, okay, I identify more with these folks over here. The other is as their bodies develop. Okay, my body is moving powerfully in the direction of being a guy. My body is moving powerfully in the direction of being a girl. I cannot resist it. Remember the breastfeeding guy? You know, that kind, like, oh my goodness, where did this breastfeeding thing come from? That kind of thing happens. The other is simply falling in love. As Walt said, you know, the overwhelming majority um, of, of transgender individuals, homosexuality and same-sex orientation has nothing to do with it. So they think, you know, I'm a little girl, but I have a boy's body, and I'm starting to kind of fall in love with girls. I'm paying attention to them. So I must be like my other guy peers. These kinds of things happen. Now, what do the experts recommend that you do with prepubescent gender dysphoric kids? We know the answer today. It's You help them change their name. 
You change their clothes. You change the design of their room. You introduce them to the classroom and the larger culture with their different name. And, and you encourage everybody to accept Stevie now as Cindy. The people at the Dutch clinic do not recommend that. They say, absolutely do not. Let's see if we have a quote here now. They say absolutely do not facilitate the change of the name, the change of the bedroom, the change of the clothes, the change of the bathroom and things like that. Why do you think they do not encourage that? It goes back to the 98%. Because up to 98, 80 to 90% of these kids they're going to get it straightened out by the time they hit puberty. And so you have a number of clinicians saying, and the world leader clinicians, you can find these studies online and read them and just see them. They say if this child, little boy who thinks he's a girl, and everybody else starts to play along with them, by the time they get 8 or 10 and they're thinking, you know what, maybe I'm not the little girl that I am but everybody around me thinks I am, maybe they're more right than I am. And as one researcher said, and he's a, 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 a gay-friendly researcher, but he's honest about this, he says that when you bring that momentum behind a very young child that way, he says, quote, that's a hell of a lot of pressure for an eight-year-old or 10-year-old child to resist against. That's why the Dutch model, they do not encourage the facilitation of that change. Now after puberty, if it persists after puberty, that's a different kind of thing that calls for a different kind of model. But this idea of an eight-month-old child, yes, let's help them, or a two-year-old child, or a three-year-old, six, eight-year-old child, let's help them. When you say, no, that's not a good idea, it's not just because you're this conservative, religious, traditionalist person. By you refusing to play along with that, you actually are in line with some of the most sophisticated clinical work going on just one, the Dutch model that they follow. You need to know that kind of confidence. Okay, the other is, does the change, the transition itself help? And we heard that from Walt, okay? He transitioned. He was living as a woman, but it, it did not solve the deeper problem within him. What we find out, and this is interesting, this is long-term research, follow-up research over a long period of time of transsexual people post-operative. And this was done in Sweden. Okay, Sweden is one of the most trans-affirming and supportive nations, communities in the world. Okay, here's what they found. Those trans individuals who had the right, who had the ability, who had the means to go through the surgery, they say that post-surgery, they need a psychological hospitalization, not just to go to the counselor, but hospitalization because of psychological issues at three times the rate of the normal population. Post-surgery, they have a 20 times higher rate of death by suicide than the general population. Get what that means. The accusation, if you do not embrace these young children and help them along in this, they will commit suicide. The, the suicide rates are much higher. But it's predicated on if you do not support, then it leads to suicide. These are people from Sweden. These are people that were supported. These were people who got the surgery. These were people who helped. And their suicide rate is 20 times still the average rate. That 
needs to break our hearts. But it also needs to tell us, you know what? Do not hold me hostage to your uh, suicide threat. Not threat from the individual, but if I don't play along, then I'm responsible for the suicides of young people. That, folks, is vile and despicable because it has no rootedness in any bit of science. There's a little bit of research on suicide rates for lesbian and gay youth. Okay, little bit of research. There is no research, though, that says whether they are accepted from their families or not from their families. There certainly isn't any research that whether they're accepted by religious communities or not. But on the trans issue, there is no research present today simply because they haven't had the methods to kind of go out and study large populations. That research just simply does not exist. So when they tell you research clearly shows that these kids, when they're not supported, will commit suicide, there is no research. In fact, research indicates just the opposite. In Sweden, post-operative, in adults, the suicide rate is still tremendously high. And the same research says post-surgical transsexuals are a risk group that need, that need long-term psychiatric and somatic follow-up. They still need this deep care. Now, I want to end with this real quick, and my time is up. But we see this phenomenon that my mind is not in accord with what my body says. There is another kind of condition that is similar to this. And one is clearly, these people are nuts. But then this issue, the trans issue, is no, this is just the way that they are. Let me tell you about this other condition. Um, it's aptaminophilia or xenomelia, two different things about it. And it's called, it's, it's what they refer to as body identity integrity disorder. And that is, in my mind, and this is a real thing, in my mind I see myself as a paraplegic, a quadriplegic. I see myself as not having the leg that I have. Some, in very extreme situations, have a story about this arm from here on down is not my arm. It belongs to a man in Nebraska who is a plumber. He has three kids. He coaches Little League. I mean, they, this is not my arm, and I know whose arm it is, and I need to get the arm off. And what they will do is many of them will have an accident. Put it on a train track to have it taken off. The drive to not be that person with this leg is so intense to either have it taken off or have it mangled so that a doctor has to come along and do a proper amputation. In fact, look at this. And these are journal articles. There's a number of journal articles on this condition. A lot of these people, they use the same language that the trans people use. I've always felt that I should be an amputee. I have always felt this is who I was, somebody who needed a peg leg or somebody who needed to be in a wheelchair. It feels right the way I should have always been and for some reason in line with what I think my body ought to have been like. Just as a transsexual is not happy with his own body but longs to have the body of another sex, in the same way I am not happy with my present body but long to be, if you will, the peg leg I was always meant to be. Okay? This creates in us tremendous compassion. But how many of us would say, let's fight for the right to have these folks be able to cut off their limbs? You do not, as one surgeon said, you do not you do not operate on the body to fix the mind. That's not where the issue lies. 
This woman here, she is not a dummy. She is a scientist for a state up in the uh, great northwest of the United States. She's a scientist. She's a professional. She is looking for a surgeon to make her a paraplegic. She hasn't had it done yet. She lives with braces on her legs. She lives in a wheelchair because living that way is in accord with who she understands herself to be. And she wants a surgeon, literally, to snip her spine so that she will not have use of her legs. Now the question is, seriously, what makes that any difference than the mind being in relation to the gender of the body? Only one difference. One has a political lobby and the other does not. The difference between this just being plain old nuts and most trans people will tell you this is nuts. But over here, this makes sense. Now here's the same thing. These people deserve compassion. To be loved, to be cared for. To say, you know what? You're beautiful in who you are. You're complete in the way you are and to help them understand that. It is not compassionate to say, let's go find somebody to cut your limbs off. It's the same over here. Even though they may not want that, they may not see that, healthy people, a healthy society says, we do not adjust the body to fix something that is going on in your mind. That's compassion. That's what we need to do. That's what the science says. And we cannot create an alternate story just because it seems politically correct or the individuals that we're dealing with want it like that. Thank you very, very much.